Um, yesterday, I gave the second sermon in the uh, series of the three sermons from Baxter Kruger's stuff, and Rick told me that it was so different from the one I gave here that he asked me to give it here again today. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go. It's the second one. You remember we talked about, uh, I went to the retreat, and Baxter Kruger got up there, and he had had a vision. And in that vision, he was in Vail, Colorado, and he saw the valley, and he was marveling at the beauty of this valley. And, of course, we all do this, Christians. We think about God and his creation and what he did for us. And, and all of a sudden, he had this vision of this huge beaver dam covered the entire valley. The thing was, you know, 100 feet high, hundreds of feet wide, just a huge, huge dam. And at the bottom of the dam, of course, the two big logs. And, of course, he wondered, I wonder what this all means. Am I just imagining this? What's going on? Of course, we start talking to God about it. He did, and behind it was this huge lake. Well, as he talked and he prayed and thought about it, the Holy Spirit slowly, you know, over time, revealed to him what it all meant. And what it came down to was that our denomination is a Trinitarian denomination. We believe that there is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three individuals bound together by love. That's what we believe. But also, as is old WCG, we have to take it a step further. We don't give up when we get some. We want it all. We're a greedy bunch. We want to know the truth of God, and we want to know it completely. And because all of us have been trained to realize that we don't know everything. We don't latch on to things like we used to and say, this is it. We are right. We won't change. None of us do that anymore. And there's a reason we don't do that, because God performed a great miracle in our lives. So here's what happened. He's looking at this vision, and he's going, what does this mean? What does this mean? And he, and, uh, and he really realized that because he was thinking about Christianity, he was learning and teaching and understanding about the Trinitarian theology, and he was accepting it, and God was working with him and working with his mind, and he spent hours and hours and hours meditating and thinking about this. The Holy Spirit realized that he had fertile ground in this mind. And so he told him, the dam represents Western Christianity. And the two logs represent some beliefs that are not right. And those beliefs are holding up this big dam, and behind this dam is the Holy Spirit. This great reservoir of the Holy Spirit, which isn't flowing because it's been dammed up. And so he thought about this, and he thought about this, and then he realized, because of his studying, because of his listening to the Holy Spirit, because of his reasoning back and forth at what's wrong, and his studying of Eastern religions and why they're different, Eastern Christianity is different, he realized that Western Christianity had some belief structures that were false. And those belief structures were the foundations of the beliefs. From this belief, we interpret Scripture. If this belief is wrong, if this foundation is wrong, then everything we believe is tainted. Not necessarily totally wrong, but it's tainted. So he was looking at us and he was thinking, okay, there's two giant logs. And so those logs, the problem was, is that Christians believe things about God that are not true. One was that God really doesn't love us. That God is an angry God and has to be appeased. That's one of the logs. And the other one is that we are separated from God. God separated himself from us when we sinned, which was at the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve listened to Satan. So those are the two big logs. So the first sermon, we talked about God's love for us. God loves us, and we don't ever have to doubt that. And that word love that God uses on us is his personality. It's who he is. 
And when we have the Christian Trinitarian, Eastern Trinitarian theology states that you have, do we still have it? Can we put it up here? Anyways, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then you have the crown of Christ, the thorny crown of Christ, which is the saving power of God. And in the center is a big GF, God's family. And God's family is every human being that has ever lived, will live, or is alive. Now, that doesn't mean that all human beings will choose to love the Father. But that doesn't mean they're not his kids. He still loves them, and he loves everybody the same. So as we go through our lives, when we were children, most of us were taught that at the Garden of Eden, when we sinned, God threw us out. And that became an underlying belief structure that we have. And from that, we interpret all things in our life. So our whole life is a flow chart. Some of us in this room have gone, been taken back by the Holy Spirit, and we've worked with some of these lines. Some of us haven't. Some of us don't even think about it. And the vast majority of Christians don't even think about it. They just accept it. This is right, and I'm not going to change. And you can tell people who are stuck in, I'm right, that's it. Yeah, there it is. That's kind of the one. Um, you get, yeah, that's the tattoo that our senior pastor, Tim, put, puts on his arm. But anyways, it's interesting that our emotional state is determined by what has happened to us in our lives. If you look at a, a man and you look at his views of women, if you go back to his childhood, you will see emotional things that have happened to him. Say he grew up in a home where dad never cheated on his mom. Dad was courteous, kind, gentle with his mom, always treated her with kit gloves, never yelled at her, never screamed at her, never blamed her for anything. He knew that they made love a lot. He would have a very solid view of how a man should feel towards women. But then again, what if he grew up in a home where the father was a womanizer? into pornography all the time, treated his mom like dirt, cheated on her constantly, but looked at pornography all the time. He's going to grow up seeing a woman as a plaything, nothing more than something to satiate his lust. That's his bottom line. That's his baseline. That's where everything comes from. Is he ever going to have a good marriage? Yeah, he might. But not likely. Because sometimes what happens if the situation like that, some young men will go, I'm not going to be like that. I can see where that's wrong. But most don't. Which is why we see so many young men today that just don't have a clue how to love a woman. They just don't have a clue. And it's because their baseline's wrong. Well, it's the same thing with our Christian beliefs. What is our baseline? Where are we coming from? What is it that we think when we read Scripture? And the sad part is it's subconscious. Baselines are subconscious. You don't even think about them. It's just there. And it's there because of our emotional lifestyle, things that have happened to us. So the kid that had the, you know, the really good father and the people around him were real men, his baseline is a happy baseline, a godly baseline. And so he's going to interpret the things that happen in his marriage from that situation. If something goes awry, he's not going to jump up and down and have some kind of a weird, that's it, we're done, we're getting a divorce. You know, I have a daughter who's married, 
And she does have problems from time to time in her marriage. But she doesn't say, oh, I'm done with you. No, she's a Christian girl. She goes to God and she says, okay, here's what's going on. What do I do? And that's what she does. And it always works out for her. But her baseline is a godly baseline. Marriage is important. You don't give up. It's a lifelong choice. That's her baseline in that particular thing. And in everything in our lives, there's baselines. There's baseline in how you think about God. There's baseline in how you think about men. There's baseline in how you think about women, children, uh, eating. My baseline on food is not for health. It's not to make me go. It's for comfort, which is why I'm always fighting my weight. My job is so hard because I can't do it the way I want to. They have made it impossible to run that department the way it's supposed to be run. They didn't do it on purpose. It's just the way it is. And so when I come home from work, how do I comfort myself? I flop down on the TV and I eat too much. So I have to fight that constantly. But my baseline about food is messed up. And guess what? Up until Dr. Kruger's message, I never thought about why it was messed up. I kind of tinkered with it a little bit and kind of understood, but yeah, I know what's going on, sort of. But now I understand. Truly, that is the problem. My baseline is messed up. We as Christians, if we truly believe God doesn't love us, if we truly believe he hates us, he would just soon not be around us, and is looking for a reason to punish us, we get a twisted look. We get a twisted baseline. It's not the baseline that God wants us to have. And when we get converted, just like it said, our heart changes. And there's this big mound of garbage in there. And God starts picking away at it. And where's he headed? He's headed to the baseline. Now, if we understand that's where he's going, it goes a lot faster. Because we have a willing mind. The hard part is, are you willing to go back through all the emotional turmoil, which is what a psychologist will do, to get to why is my baseline the way it is? What caused me to get there? See, because we bury that. We don't want to deal with that stuff. It hurts too much. So many things. that I've talked about a lot of the things that, that have happened to me in my past negative. Well, I do that because it brings me down to that baseline. It brings me back to the beginning. Why do I feel the way I feel? Why can't I love the way the Father loves? Why can't I? It's because my baseline is screwed up. That's why. What I determine everything from is based upon my emotional upheavals, mostly as a child. Things that my parents did that I took this way, but now I know they meant this way. And when you have those bad things happen, or good, you do create a baseline. So what was my baseline? My baseline was that I was stupid. I, anything I wanted to do was dumb. And that baseline was down, and it caused no end of grief. That my thoughts were stupid, and nobody wanted to listen to me. Nobody cared what I thought, because my parents would never listen to what I wanted. They never asked me what I wanted. If I would do something, they didn't say, what would you do that for? They just said, that's stupid, go change it. And so when you have that over and over and over and over again, guess what? From here to here, maybe that was the case. But these other ones maybe weren't that. But that is how you take them. And you interpret it that way. And it builds up and confirms that wrong belief. You know, I know that my parents never thought I was stupid. They never not, did not want to know what I thought. Unfortunately, they just didn't know how to react properly as a parent. They didn't realize that when you do that to a person, it created what it created. Why? 
because their parents did it to them, and their parents did it to their parents, and their parents did it to their grandparents, and nobody paid any attention to why it was happening. Well, we live in a time when God's not willing to let that happen anymore. Once you become his child, he wants to fix your baseline. The thing about thinking that God hates us, that he doesn't love us, that baseline is massively destructive. It confuses us terribly because you have guys like me up here telling you how much he loves you, but your baseline says, no, he don't love me. He don't want me around. That's wrong. And you get into this convoluted kind of thinking, and that's good because it makes you think. But I wrote down a statement here that I wrote down because when I was thinking about this, it's amazing, but this is what I actually thought. And I thought to myself, I need to go into the deep, dark place, the depth of my soul, my subconscious, where I stuff things that I don't really want to think about and I will just operate from. And we all do this. So go into the deep, dark, locked up, and guarded area of your soul, your subconscious, way down deep, right down the bottom baseline where everything comes from, and see if this statement or one similar is your core belief about the Father. And here it is. God only tolerates me when I do good, and I must suck up to Jesus when I do evil so God won't kill me. Because I am unworthy of being loved by God because of my sin, but God loves Jesus. When, so I see, but God loves Jesus, so when I do evil, so God, let's see, I messed up, oh, I must suck up to Jesus when I do evil, so God won't kill me, because I am unworthy of being loved by God, but God loves Jesus and will give him whatever he wants. He really does not love me, but he does Jesus. We would think that's something that a child would say. You know, when you're talking to them and how they're trying to get things together, they're maturing. Well, we're children. Children of God, and we're growing. Becoming more like Jesus every day. But we get confused if the bottom line isn't right. You know... If you have something like that in you, you may not even know it. If you don't pray about it, think about it, meditate about it, possibly fast about it, consider, why do I feel the way I do? Then you read scripture, it's God is mean. They sinned, they got what they deserved. This horrible happened, that horrible happened. You know, it's like, King David, when he and Bathsheba did their thing. God treated David, it seems like, in two ways. Let's just read what happened. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. But you have given your enemies the, uh, of the Lord great opportunity to despise and blaspheme him, so your child will, not, will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord made Bathsheba's baby deathly ill. David begged God to spare the child. But we know what happens. The child died. And the interesting thing about the, the child's death is two things. One, God actually killed that child. It says so. God made the child get deathly ill and the child died. Now, if we look at it from God doesn't love me, now I'm evil, I got what I deserved, we would look at it, no, David got what he deserved. He deserved to be punished for that. But if you look at it from the side of God is love, why did God take that child? What was love? What part of love is that? Well, maybe our baseline on what we think love is is wrong. Maybe we don't understand love. We live in a society where love has been so abused that it means sex. And when we look back and we look at love, 
when we were watching Mary give birth to Jesus, here's God, the creator of all things. If he doesn't love us and he doesn't like us, why would he subject his son himself to suckling on the breast of a woman? Why would he subject himself to that? And so we, we look at, you know, we, we think of God the kind of love-hate relationship with humanity. If you do what I want, I'm going to let you live with me forever. And so we struggle, running around trying to do good deeds, trying to show God that we love him. Trying to get back to him, trying to be close to him, trying to do what he says. After all, I'm rotten to the core and I just deserve to die. But there again, that could be another wrong baseline. The penalty of sin is death, true. But God says, no, you're my child. You deserve to live. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to be loved. You deserve to love. You deserve to live in my inner sanctum up there. You deserve to be happy. And then we have, you deserve love. You deserve joy. You deserve peace. You deserve kindness. You deserve long-suffering. You deserve gentleness. And you can have it. And all you have to do is truly love me. So if our baseline leads us to a point that is wrong, and everything is interpreted wrong from there, we're in a real mess. But we don't have to be. Because God has us in his hands, and he won't let go. But you know what? After that sermon yesterday, on the way home, Nancy and I were talking, and it struck me that there is one the true baseline that sits at the bottom of all this or at the top and goes down wherever you want to look at it is do you as a human being believe one that god loves you and two god wants to love you do you believe you are worthy of love do you believe that god does love you that's what it all comes down to that belief structure and in Western Christianity, you are not taught that God loves you unless you do blah, 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 blah. And that's not true. And we're all in our 50s and 60s, 40s, whatever we are. That's a lot of years of baselines being wrong. And the day is going to come as we all go to the Holy Spirit and say, fix this, fix this, fix this. I am willing. My heart is open. My mind is open. I'm willing to go back to the baseline. Take me. It won't be so bad because when you go, God will be with you. He won't make you go alone. And what it takes is to go to that baseline, realize the truth of the matter. I'm telling you, only God can tell you what that truth is. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can tell you, and he will. He'll make you understand because you want him to. It's a gift. And we as Christians, a small little group, GCI, there's only 50,000 of us, something like that. And all of us are learning about our baseline. One way or another, if you listen to everything that all the churches are talking about, some of them haven't come blatantly straight at it yet, but they are. It's our baselines. What do we truly believe? Headquarters is changing all the time. They're coming up with, oh, man, that is true. Then that's true. But that can't be true. They don't sit there and say, we know it all yet. We probably know this much. And this room is all there is to know. And we're just going to keep growing and keep changing. That's one of the things I like about GCI more than anything else. Is they, they never assume they know everything. And we are learning and we are growing.
So dig deep. Take a good, close look. One, do you believe God loves you? Always has loved you and will never stop loving you. There's nothing you can do to stop him from loving you. Or do you believe that God's a Zeus? Just looking for some reason to throw a lightning bolt at you. He doesn't like you much. If it wasn't for Jesus, he'd kill us all. Is that the structure you have? If you grew up like I did in the Methodist church or probably the universal church, the Catholic church, or Presbyterian or any of those, that's kind of what you're going to believe. Because I can remember in Sunday school telling us, if you guys don't be good, God's going to. Okay. I'm rotten to the core. God doesn't really like me much. No matter what I do, I'm wrong. Why bother to try? Have you ever wondered why the young in our country pretty much have no use for God? Because they don't want to believe that way. They don't want to believe that God's a Zeus getting ready to zap them. Or that God's up there saying, you have to do this, 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 and this, anything else, you're bad. They don't want to, they don't want to believe it. Which is a good thing. Because that makes it a little bit easier on the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have to go in there and knock out the I'm rotten part. So as you go about your week, as you pray and study and think and get lost in your thoughts, consider your baselines. Spend some time thinking about them. Try to determine, why is it I can't love the way the Father loved? Why can't I love the way Jesus loved? Why can't I just accept the fact that so-and-so has this horrible sin, thing that he does or she does, and just forget about that. Don't even look at that. God doesn't really see our sin that much. He knows it's there. And he's in the Holy Spirit working with us to get rid of it. But he sees us as this wonderful individual that's going to spend eternity with his son, his daughter. And like I said last time, he wants us to crawl up into his lap and cry if we need to cry. Crawl up into his lap and tell him a dumb story about something stupid. He loves it. He's a dad. But for us to have the life he wants us to have, we have got to go to our baselines and see if they are true. See if they are correct. You know, our baseline can have a lot of bad stuff in it, but we have to understand the, what that bad stuff was. It wasn't mom and dad hating us. It wasn't the bully hating us. It, the bad stuff that other people do to us comes from their problems, almost always. They don't realize they're doing it. Most people don't decide, oh, I hate that person, and I'm going to go. That happens sometimes. But even that comes from a problem of theirs we happen to be the recipient of. Jesus died on the cross, not from his problem, our problem. But he understood it. Good thing, he's God. If he didn't understand it, nobody would. So the conclusion of this is that we have baselines. We all do. And that's the thing that everything else is interpreted from. If the baseline is solid, the interpretations should be solid. Or if it, the interpretation is a little skewed, you'll notice it. And you'll be able to fix it. Yeah. Yeah, take us back and show us the truth of the matter. And when you know Daddy didn't hate me, that changes it. Oh, maybe he did love me. Mom didn't hate me for this. They weren't belittling me. They weren't telling me I was stupid. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't. When you get to the end is, oh, maybe they really did love me. Maybe I am worthy of love. Well, Well, that depends. Why were they a bad parent? They couldn't be a good parent. Their makeup was so screwed up. Their baseline was so bad, and they didn't understand it. They couldn't be a bad parent. It's not that they didn't love you. They probably did. Yeah, get the proper look at what things are and don't hold them responsible. I mean, we're all adults here. 
There is no reason for us to say, I'm this way because my daddy. Oh, come on. Yeah. In the end, this comes down to there are some things that are not ours to judge. They are ours to work on, to learn and to see what it means, and then we're to act on that knowledge. But it's not ours to judge. No. Just try to understand and accept it. It's just the way it was, but I don't have to accept that as my baseline. So as we go through our activities this week, next week, week after, try to consider why we do what we do. And if it's something you go, you know, this really is something I shouldn't be doing, work your way back. Find out why are you doing that? Because it's really hard to change if you don't know why you're doing something. It's like trying to fix a car. If you don't know why a car does what it does, right, Dave? You're never going to figure out what's wrong. Yeah, this piece has to do this. Yep, that's doing that, and this will do that, and this will do that. That becomes that, and that becomes that. Same thing with our human minds. You know, we have a lot to fight with. We got Satan, who is the author of all the wrong thoughts in Western Christianity. He's the one that did it, and he did it on purpose, and he had it all planned from the Garden of Eden. And he's done a very good job. Western Christianity is pretty screwed up. So and then you have your own human nature. It'll lie to you constantly. And then you have people around you who don't want to live a righteous life. They want to do something shady or dishonest. And you have to fight all this all the time. And it's really hard if our baseline's kind of messed up and we don't have that strength of a solid baseline to fall back on all the time, which is, you know what? God loves me. And because he loved me, I can love him. That's what he says. You love me because I loved you first. You know, we're just 10 individuals here and another seven or 10 in Olympia. I mean, not Olympia, Tacoma. But from those 10, there's no telling what God could do. If we can fix our baseline, what does that do? That rips a log out, and that dam gets weak. And then next time I talk, it'll be about, are we separated from God? And if we can understand the truth about that, that rips out that other log. And guess what? That dam's going to collapse. And all the other little faulty, wrong things that we all learn because of those two logs collapse, and the Holy Spirit will flow. And when a dam breaks, it's not a trickle. It's a flood. That's what that vision is saying. God is saying to us, look, folks, I love you. Don't ever forget that. But I need you to believe it. And when you believe it, the Holy Spirit will flow. And when it flows, there will be miracles. There will be signs and wonders. There will be all kinds of things that happen during the New Testament church and throughout history. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We need not to be afraid to talk with other Christians or anybody who asks. You know, when they, people, as you fix your baselines, you become happier and happier and happier. You smile more, you experience more joy, peace, comfort. You're happier. Things don't bother you. You just kind of go with the flow because you realize that you're not a citizen of earth. You're a citizen of heaven. And so it really doesn't matter about the physical thing so much anymore. And people start to ask you, how come you're so happy all the time? And you can simply tell them, look, God loves me. He has held me in his arms my whole life and yours. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you. He loves you. He will never leave you. People don't believe it. Because all the comments I hear from the people, especially at work, that's where I socialize most outside of church, 
because God's an ogre. I'm not going to worship a God that does these mean things. That's the view they have of God. And that view has been portrayed through the Western Christian churches in our culture. You're going to go to hell if you do that, if you lie. I used to joke about that, but I don't anymore. Because whether you want to believe it or not, some people take it very seriously and it, it hurts them. Because they know they're doing wrong. But they can't stop themselves and they don't know why. It's because their belief structure is messed up of God. And if we can help them to straighten that out, because with some people, they just need to be told once. And they already want it so bad that they accept it right away. And those are the ones that the Holy Spirit and God the Father has already called and primed. It's not our job to you know, convince anybody of anything. It's our job to be an example and speak the truth. Because the Holy Spirit tells us what to say and when to say it. If you have the urge to say something to somebody, it's not you. It's the Holy Spirit. So just say it. Gently. Kind. Kindness. Matter of fact. Unjudgmental. Well, you know, God really does love you. And he doesn't really care that you do these kind of things. All he wants is for you to love him back. Oh, that's too easy. That's not what I'm told. I'm told I have to tithe, I have to go to church, I have to do this, do that, do this, do that, do all these things, and then God will love me. No, he loves you, period. You don't have to do any of those things. But I tell you, when you realize how much God loves you, and you start to love him back, you're going to want to do those things. And then when that love, you will have joy, you will have peace, you will have all that comes. Once we realize that God loves us. So be cognizant that you have bottom lines. They are there. And we need to ask God to help us understand them. Because sometimes it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can understand them. And realize that some things that have happened to some people are so horrible that you get down close to the bottom line and you bounce off it for a while until you are emotionally able to handle it. And the Holy Spirit will work on that. He's not going to force anything on any of us. We don't need to be afraid to look at our bottom line. Because a lot of times, they're not as horrible as we think they are. We're adults now. And we won't look at them as a child looked at them. We'll go, oh, yeah, that really wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Really, it was kind of like this, and it's okay. I can deal with that. That wasn't God. That was Satan. That was years and years and decades and decades of wrong thinking that people had. Our bottom line needs to become, God loves me and he has always loved me. And there's nothing anywhere that can change that. So remember, when I just start to tell you that we fell at the tree of good and evil and whatnot, we didn't fall. We made a decision. That's all. And God didn't throw us out of the Garden of Eden because he hated us and we were bad and that's what we got. He threw us out of the Garden of Eden for our own good. He didn't want us to have an eternity of hell. Could you imagine if we had to live like this forever? With all the misery and suffering and hatred and anger that come? He couldn't let us eat of the tree of life. He just couldn't. It would have killed him if God could die. Because what he wants is to live with us forever, but in a state of love, kindness and gentleness and peace. So it, it was an act of love he put us out of the Garden of Eden. It was an act of love that he made us dig in the dirt for our food. It was an act of love that he made our wives have such hard childbirth. 
What was the love in that? The whole Bible is a love story. From beginning to end, it's a love story. God's love for his kids. And if we can read scripture that way, we don't see an angry, I'm going to get you God. We say a kind and a gentle and a loving God. Why did he treat Israel the way he did? They were a people. They were an example of, for the world, of, if you love me, this is how it is. If you don't, this is how it is. And you see it over and over and over again. Yeah, God used words like vengeful and vengeance and this, you know, those kind of words. But it was because of the situation they were in. It was to get them to realize that, look, you made a promise to me. You would do all these things. And if you do all these things, I will do all these things. And when they did, he did. When they didn't, he didn't. Actually, he did. He did what he said he would do if they didn't. But now we're in the New Testament church anyways. It's we are his children. We are not his people. And you don't treat your children like your people. He is not just our king, and we are his servants, his subjects. He is our daddy, and we are his children. And I tell you what, children who love their father are the greatest joy a human being can have, and their mother, their parents. So the greatest joy we can give God is to love him. And when that happens, everything straightens out. So I guess uh, if we're going to title this sermon, I guess we should call it uh, the bottom line, love. And that is the bottom line. It's an overworked, overused word in our culture. And I think Satan did that on purpose. I don't think it was a mistake. I don't think it was something that just happened. I think we've got to realize that Satan's a sneaky dude and he is working his best to make sure there is no face on the earth when Christ returns. But thankfully, he's not God, and God is much stronger. And guess what? Every single one of you in this room's last name is God. We are stronger than Satan. Because you have the power of God in you, the Holy Spirit. And there's a dam that must be broke. And who knows? Maybe this group is the group God's going to use to break it. We don't know. It may be nothing more than now that we know, we can pray hard. We can beseech the Father, please destroy the dam. Rip it down. Stick a bomb under it. Do whatever you've got to do to get rid of that. Because there's a lot of people suffering because of that dam. Going to end in prayer here. Holy Father, our God, our King. Human beings were made in a very special way. We were made in your image, and we know that your bottom line is love. There is nothing that doesn't come out of that love, and it's everywhere, and it's in everything. You're so patient with all of humanity. You allow us to do whatever we want. We get to make a choice. We get to choose good. We get to choose evil. Just as we get to choose to look at our bottom line, or we can choose not to. However, we will have the results of whichever way we go. Father, you love us. We know that in our minds, there is no doubt that you love us. We know that you say so, and we believe you. It's in the heart. Do we feel it in our soul? Do we feel it? Do we feel like you love us? We think about other people who we know love us, and we know how our heart feels and our love towards them. We need to feel it in our heart that we love you, Father. It needs to be so strong and so powerful that we have no doubt that we love you like you love us. So, Father, give us strength. Help us to dig deep. Help us to go long. Help us to be willing to suffer the consequences of the pain that might come from looking at our depths of our soul, getting down into that subconscious, getting down to that bottom line. Do we truly believe that you love us? Because when we truly believe it, we will feel it in our hearts, in our soul, in our being. And when that happens, 
We don't want to hurt you anymore. We don't want to sin. Sure, we will from time to time because we're human. But at, it's just like David. Oh, I have sinned, Father. I'm sorry. Give, forgive me. That's exactly what David did. So, Father, bless us and guide us and give us strength to go deep. Help us to work on our bottom lines, to find out what they are and why they are the way they are, and to make them like Jesus' bottom line. You know, he said it over and over and over again from his love for you. Not your, my will, but your will be done. So, Father, not our will, but your will be done in our hearts. And we ask all these things in the one you sent as our example of what love is, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.